Okay. Hello, everyone. What a wonderful turnout tonight. Um, and thank you for being part of this very special evening, which is hosted by To Sylvia's Weekly Muse Zoom series. I'm Kelly Russell Agadon. I'm one of the co-founders of To Sylvia's Press, and I'm here with my co-founder, Annette Spalding Convy, who's behind the scenes tonight, um, letting you in, muting you, and um, helping you out. Annette and I are so honored to introduce two of our favorite poets and people, Susan Rich and Diane Seuss. Um, and the, for those who are new to our Weekly Muse community, the Weekly Muse, um, which is sponsoring this reading, is a paid subscription from Substack that arrives in your inbox every Sunday morning, full of prompts and places to submit, along with eight poetry Zoom classes, at least eight, taught by our favorite poets. And we had had Di and Susan teach classes for us, and they were truly inspiring classes. Um, and tonight we're announcing we've just added um, a new poet, our newest poet this summer, which will be Jane Hirschfield, who will be leading the summer session. So if you're interested in signing up, I will put a link in the chat. So now that you know about who... Did I, was I muted? Oh, fun. Am I, did, was I muted the whole time? No, just for a minute. That's fun. This will be a good recording. Um, thanks for telling me to unmute. So now that you know who we are at Two Sylvia's, let me introduce the superstars of the evening, which are Susan Rich and Diane Seuss. Both of these poets are friends of mine and inspire me in so many ways. First, their poems. They are both focused on craft and imagery. And when I read their poems, I feel as if I'm inside the poems. Um, in other words, I'm immersed. Second, they are both stellar literary citizens in our community and in the world. And third, as humans on the planet, their compassion and generosity does not go unnoticed. And they also both have brand new books out in the world. Susan's being Blue Atlas from Red Hen Press, which is releasing today. So we are thrilled to help her celebrate and launch her reading tonight. And Diane's newest book is Modern Poetry, which came out on March 5th from Grey Wolf Press. And how absolutely lucky we are to have both of these poets reading from these gorgeous collections and in conversation tonight. Um, I'm going to put their full bios and links to their books in the chat. So if you have not purchased a copy of their books for yourself or someone else, please do so. So without any more delay, let us welcome the most modern and dazzling blue poets of the evening, Susan Rich and Diane Seuss. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. I'm, I'm going to mute while Susan reads. Can everyone hear me okay? Or Kelly, can you hear me okay? I guess I just need to make sure. All right. Well, Thank you so much. This feels like the absolute best way to launch a book um, with people who I respect and love so much and um, in, in the comfort of my own home. So I don't have to worry about falling off a stage and I can get to the poem. So thank you. I'm going to start with the first poem in the book, which is called This Could Happen. And I just saw that it was published 10 years ago. So the poems in this book kind of span that amount of time. Of course, you know, it wasn't written the moment, wasn't published the moment it got written. And I just say that because I don't think I knew that this was going to be a book in a book um, on this subject, but it works, I hope, as an introduction and as a sense that this isn't only my experience, but perhaps your experience or someone experience you know. This could happen. If you kept walking, you would eventually step outside of yourself. You would leave the bones of your body, the bloodlines to all that you loved. You would be free of breasts, liberated from the eyes of body admirers. To travel this earth like a star lily or a skunk flower with the forbearance of golden bees if you kept walking out of the self, you could begin again as seawater, as spindrift. Don't worry, you'd say. 
You're a virgin non-body. You're a witness to 10,000 new worlds. No lungs, no heart, no breath. Irresistible now, what might you see? A bird's dying shudder or lovers knotted in a plot line of release? You're an example now of nothing, a fountain of nowhere. I tend to find that quite hopeful. I'm not sure everybody would agree with that. The next poem is called Post-Abortion Questionnaire Powered by Survey Monkey. And it got its um, inspiration from a poem by Oliver de La Paz, Autism Questionnaire, which was the same idea in that you got a prompt from an online questionnaire in my case, I don't know if Oliver's was, and then it took you somewhere that you might have trouble getting to. And as I was working on this, I can remember being at a residency and calling Kelly and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm out of my mind. And she said, no, keep going, keep going. So I, I thank Kelly for um, keeping me going. It's a little bit of a long poem and you'll hear the question, I'll pause, and then you'll hear the response. So here goes. Post-abortion questionnaire powered by SurveyMonkey. Do you feel reluctant to talk about the subject of abortion? In the center of the ceiling, a marigold weeps, or perhaps it's an old chandelier. Look, inside there is another worldly glow, shards illuminated in violet pink and layers of peeling gold leaf. Such minds at night unfold. Do you feel guilt or sorrow when discussing your own abortion? The cabbage is a blue rose, an alchemical strip show. They scream when dragged from the earth, only to find themselves plunged into boiling water. The narrative unscrolls from cells of what ifs and hourglass hopes. Have you found yourself either avoiding relationships or becoming overly dependent on them? If I could unhinge myself from myself, attach to bookshelves, sever my tongue, I would watch as it grew back, rejuvenated and ready to speak. Do you have lingering feelings of resentment towards people involved in your abortion? Perhaps the baby's father or your parents? One must be careful what one takes when one turns away forever. A Toreg scarf, two photographs, untamed thoughts that curse then lift, Occasionally, yes, but mostly not. Do you tend to think of your life in terms of before and after the abortion? Too scared to speak my name, not etherized upon the table. I wore silver stirrups, wrap around globe. The young nurse and I held hands. You're doing great, she cooed. I remained awake, awakened. Have you felt a vague sort of emptiness, a deep sense of loss, or had prolonged periods of depression? The sky no longer speaks to me directly, and the beautiful man, he has dropped through the floorboards, though sometimes he answers emails. Thank you, our family has survived the Paris bombings. Sincere condolences on your new president. Do you sometimes have nightmares, flashbacks, or hallucinations relating to the abortion? Never mind, I tell myself, it's only a nightmare. 
But then I remember I'd barely gone to bed at all. Then 30 years had passed, now 31. Have you begun or increased use of drugs or alcohol since the abortion? Do you have an eating disorder? First, the fog tastes sweet, then sour. What is identity but forged glamour? Strong doses of celibacy taken regularly. Did your relationship to or concept of God or karma or fate change after your abortion? If my own voice falters, tell them I tried not to live inside the clock or under the skin of pomegranates. Does anyone escape her own story? Head on collision, Northeaster, earthquake, the racist seeding of our own country? Has your self-concept or self-esteem changed since your abortion? Once I abandoned my car in a forest of red cedar, let it tumble down the mountain by itself. In the next diorama, there's a friend at the wheel and she word urges, let's go on, build yourself like a paint color, like an infant song. Are you bothered by certain sounds like machinery that makes loud noises? Coffee grinder, dust buster, singer sewing machine. Also, truck backfire, sparkler, the sharp scrape of chair legs, gunfire overhead, hand saws, the evening news. Aren't you? Is there anything else you would like to ask us? Why does Google Maps allow blind spots? For example, the city of Zindir, Niger. Is it possible for one person to photograph each galaxy to understand this bewilderment of light? I don't think I've ever read that poem out loud all the way through before. So thank you. Thank you for, for being there for it. And I had a whole explanation of what I was going to say about what the book was about, but I think we'll get to a conversation later. I think I'm going to keep going with the poems. This next poem is called Crepe Myrtle, and I'm reading it because I don't know if it'll be clear to anyone else, but I know that I was reading Frank sonnets when I wrote this poem. And I thank you, Diane, for giving me that kind of long line and kind of that, um, that rhythm that would take me places I didn't know I was going to go. Um, and to my friend Angie Voorhees, who's here tonight, who took me out to the old growth forest near where I live and taught me about crepe myrtle. I should have been a crepe myrtle, resistant to pets. I'm sorry, I'm going to start again. Crepe myrtle. I should have been a crepe myrtle, resistant to pests and disease. Should have been known by my nicknames, purple magic, ebony flame. I'd have passed my life as a hip resting spot for cardinals, larks, and blue tits. Could have been a pine siskin, an elegant flash of wing, been a star magnolia close to extinction in the wild child world. Sexy as a fragrant fringe cup drinking it up along the riverbeds. A salmon berry, a lady fern. I should have kept the baby, all the best flowers single blooms, all the boy birds, yellow-bellied sapsuckers, could have nested in the cavity of a blue atlas, become a field note, bilingual, old, fought romantic battles with stinging nettles, avoided mildew and armored scale. Now I night jasmine, I honeysuckle, I myrtle, 
requiring little water or microbial soil. And finally, the last poem in the book, it's been a quick trip. <laughs> it's called Attempt Attempting Speculative Fiction. There's a space inside me like a tree house topped with mysteria vine. The windows point like a compass to my second self where S strides in past globes and oceans, walks up to the bar, says whiskey neat without the please, says nothing about sorrow. I listen from somewhere far away as she holds the floor with her bookish looks, the seasons don't fuck with me boots. She's an actor or a double agent, all five car stud, chiseled cheekbones and hopes. Yet here in my house with triple locks and wireless alarms, my mortgaged heart, I wonder how she will get home. What catastrophe might follow? I write down the thousand different things the world might do and then erase them to the young girl who walked out, who didn't lock the door. And now I have the wonderful job of introducing Diane Zeus, who needs no introduction, but I think of that like the don't fuck with me boots as something that Diane would wear. I'm kind of like thinking she has a pair. So that's that's my transition point for Diane. And I'm so, so happy to have you here tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Susan. And what a great reading, my God. Just beautiful. I've loved this book for a while because I had a chance to read it early. And um couldn't wait till it hit the stage. So tonight we celebrate Susan and we thank to Sylvia's Press, and Kelly and Annette. And Susan, thank you for including me. Um, okay, so I'll read four poems. Um, let's see. This is from Modern Poetry. It's called Kama. To never be touched again. That line has a sound, hear it? I don't want to bring a story to it, not even an image. It has a sound, listen. To never be touched. Oh, a nurse, a doctor, but never to be touched in that way. You know what way. Listen, hear it. Let's not tag it with a feeling. Give me a break. What possible song would you play when you toss my ashes? Someone once asked me. There is no song, he said. Don't narrativize, Diane. Don't narrativize Diane. See what a comma can do. I debated whether to read this, but I think I will in a sisterhood with Susan's whole book. Uh, this is from Frank Sonnets. And I guess a little content warning uh, about drug use. I aborted two daughters. How do I know they were girls? A mother knows. At least one daughter, maybe one daughter and a son. Will it hurt? I asked the pre-abortion lady, and she said her eyes were so level. I haven't been stupid enough to need to find out. Cruel, but she was right. I was an M stupid. 
please no politics. I've never gotten over it. No, I don't regret it. Two girls with a stupid penniless mother and a drug addict father? I don't think so. I shot a rabbit once for food. I am not pristine. I am not good. I am in no way Jesus. I am in no way even the bad Mary, let alone the good. Though I have held my living son in the Pieta pose, I didn't know at the time I was doing it. But now that I look back, he'd overdosed and nearly died. My heart, he said, his lips blue. Don't worry, I've paid. You know, reading Susan's book, I think about sort of where where poems come from or what are the life experiences that make poets. Um, I guess there are probably some who were made without <coughs> going through hell. But I mean, most people do go through kinds of hell. <coughs> and for whatever reason, certain of us face the gaps, face the absence left behind by whatever. And, and it calls us to fill it with language. I'm not sure why. This is called penetralium. And it's, um, that was a word that Keats coined, meaning sort of the inner sanctum or the, the heart of something. I wish I could tell you how deep the suck goes, how dark it is and holy. It's tragedy siloed. They dot the landscape with oxen, mud hooved and crows. Shakespearean, but boiled down, a thick gravy, oversalted, served on white bread, day old, sold cheap at the bakery outlet. It broods on the woodland edge, morbidly forested and bottle green, fermented in swamp, dung, skunk, and bridled by sorcery, potions, Bible school puppetry, ogres, fairies, poorly rendered paper mache, good and bad Samaritans. Kept awake by raw, honest terrors, eviction dreams, half-conscious fantasies of terrible mothers wielding hatchets, but oddly free, like a free lunch is free, or a vacant lot, or a stinkweed bouquet. Just sit with it as you'd sit with a legless drunk who won't shut up about the bygone. Don't bring your sobriety narratives to this bedside, Diane. Be drunk, it's the only way, raved de Baudelaire. Corkscrewed through and through with syphilis. How artless, this source of art, this shit show where the greenest watercress grows. And I'll end, um, for me, this is a happy poem. <laughs> it's as happy as it gets. And it's called Juke. What kind of juke do you prefer? For me, it's the kind with three songs and 37 blank title strips. Three songs, and two of them are Luckenbach, Texas. The third is beautiful and arcane, but the patrons hate it and the record skips. I prefer the three song juke and the three toothed human smile. I found the juke of my dreams in a bar called Chums. 
no clue the origin or meaning of the quotation marks around the name. It was a prime number of a bar and now it's dead. One night drinking half and half, half beer, half tomato juice with schnapps chasers, a cheap source of hallucination. A soon to be defrocked Catholic priest, Vic, my mother and me, our faces streaked blue with pool chalk, juke red as a beating heart, and just a strip of hollyhocks and a tree line between us and the northern lights. I was young. I looked like a Rubens painting of a woman half eaten by moths. What lucky debauchery, the ride back on a washboard dirt road, taking everything for granted, flipping off the aurora borealis like it was some three-toothed human in flashy clothes dancing to get my attention. I wasn't a mean drunk then, just honest. Next morning, mom walked in on the naked priest in the shack's garage, washing himself with a rag and cold water from the well in a metal dishpan. I'd later do dishes in that pan and wash my hair in that pan. We popped popcorn on the one burner wood burning stove and ate it out of that pan. I'm talking about a time and a place. All I can say of it is that it was real. The song choices were limited, so the grooves were dug deep. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Susan, can we talk? We can, although I'm just thinking about those grooves and doing your hair in that pot and the popping of the popcorn. So um, I'm in another world, but I think it's a world that I'm I'm happy to stay in and 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 keep talking to you about your poems. Cool. Well, can I start with a question for you? This is your grand opening, girl, for Blue Atlas, and I wondered if we could start with just. Um, Tell me about that title and how that image functions in the book. I will tell you what I know. Okay. I always, I love titles. I could talk all night about titles, but I also find titling books quite difficult. Mm -hmm. This had a lot of other titles. It was called Double Agent and Secret Agent. And now oh, I can't imagine it as anything other than Blue Atlas. And I think I wanted something a lot of this is done, as you know, on an unconscious or subconscious level. So pretending that I knew what I was doing is a little bit of a performance. But I will say that I wanted something that encompassed a large geographical area. The book starts off in Niger, West Africa, where I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I spend a short time in Paris with the um, almost father and then Morocco and New York is in there as well. So I wanted something that dealt with that. And Blue Atlas, to me, the color blue is just something I've identified with my whole life. I don't know why it's the color that I have on my background and what I often wear, but that wasn't enough. That was sort of like, well, that's kind of pretty and I like the sound of it and it evokes an image. And then I started looking for other meanings of Blue Atlas. And when I found that a blue atlas is a type of cedar tree that is original um, to, that's not the right word, how do you say that? It comes from Morocco, but mm. it also has moved around the world. And there's many of them in the Pacific Northwest where I live. It's a beautiful tree. It's known to be the strongest tree. And um, it doesn't need another tree to reproduce. I'm not sure any tree needs another tree to reproduce, but the blue atlas does not. It so would be weird if they did though. <laughs> <laughs> I like the image. <laughs> After it gets dark out in the forest, all kinds of things can happen. <laughs> the blue atlas was a tree that had been around the block. It had been to places where I had lived, places that I loved and it endured. 
And I'm not, I don't think of myself as a nature writer, but as um, I think Jen Martel Martelli told me when she was looking at this book, there's many, many trees in the book. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps what I think I might have been doing, that doesn't sound very convincing. What I was doing was getting a positive, living, natural image to hit against, to have a juxtaposition with what was going on in the speaker's life. And it just felt like it just kept coming in in this way that I've never written about trees before, but they're all over the place in this book. And there's, I think, three or four poems that reference Blue Atlas. Mm -hmm. So I think I was trying to use it as my, um, the word in, in West Africa is grigri, my kind of charm, my amulet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it came into the book, well, you know, there's the title and then it chimes, as my editor, Jeff Schatz, used that term and I love it, it chimes through um, a few different poems. And when it would chime, I would feel okay, like I know where I am, you know, I, I feel acclimated um, in terms of image um, and feeling. Um, yeah, titling is a mysterious process, isn't it? And I love how a title will sort of find you. I love it that you you looked it up and then there was more and that convinced you you had the right thing. Would you talk about titles? Like I said, it's my one of my favorite subjects. And I've been looking at your titles, and especially in modern poetry. Your titles are usually one or two words. I think you have a couple that are three. There's an untitled poem. There's the poem that ends with the word bitch. And I'm just <laughs> wondering, I, that struck my my interest. Mm -hmm. If you could talk about um, what, your, what your ideas are when you're titling poems in particular. Okay. Yeah, when I... Um... My first, let's see, um, my book, Wolf Lake, White Gown, Blown Open, and Four-Legged Girl, both of those books, especially probably Four-Legged Girl, used um, titles that became the first of the poem. And I like that kind of, I liked what a unit of a line as a title felt like and looked like and how it then just sort of led the reader and led me into the body of the poem. I like being led. Um, and then with Frank, there are no titles. Um, so, you know, and that suited the structure of the book of moving from sonnet to sonnet so that they all connect. There isn't the interruption of the title. Um, Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl, I skipped and I shouldn't. Um, that That's a book, too, where the titles are sort of part of the dance, you know. This book, I really wanted to change it up. And it wasn't even an intellectual um, ar argument I had about with myself about it. It just seemed there was something kind of classical I was going for um, with the title of the book, Modern Poetry. It's it's a parody, but but it's also classical. And then um, and then these sort of simple one or two word titles and especially um, titles that, that are after parts of music or kinds of music. Um, like Aria or um, coda or, you know, um, or penetralium. So yeah, the, I wanted to sort of diminish the talkiness uh, of the titles and let them be labels. I used to call single word um, titles like toe tags on a dead body. <laughs> um, but in this book, I sort of wanted the toe tag, you know, <laughs> I I like the idea you, you you mentioned the um the tree being this this thing that sort of held you up you know the blue atlas held you up through the the striations of feeling I guess and um that's how I saw the sonnet and Frank and that's how I sort of saw the the structuredness of the poems in this book. 
um, it's something to hold you up through yeah. through tough work, you know. Yeah, I do know. Do you want one more title thing as the title of modern poetry, which, you know, works on so many levels. It brings me back to we're not that different in age. So I remember having that book, that sense of what life was like at that particular moment mm -hmm. of what poetry meant. And it feels incredibly um, expansive that it allows you to talk about what's going on in your own life but also kind of how you're learning about poetry and what poetry looked like when it was Wallace Stevens and Gertrude Stein and all of those folks that we all read. And I wondered at what point in writing the book you understood that you were going to call it modern poetry because it feels like it's such an organizing principle. Um, and so I'm imagining helpful, but I don't know at what point um, you found it. Well, <clears throat> The title poem was one of the earliest poems that I wrote, and it really just kept kind of going on. I I made it a point after 14 line poems, you know, um, from Frank to say I'm going to write past, for the most part, past the ending, past the ending, past the ending, and see what happens beyond of Holmes ending. So thinking about that class, modern poetry, and everything it represented, and who I was, and what a dunderhead I was, and yet I wanted it. I, I wanted, I, I needed it. So all of that, and then I ran some titles by Jeff kind of early on, um, and he just said, it's modern poetry. <laughs> you know, that's the right that's the right title. And, and so that kind of had a feedback loop and I lived with that and added to it. But it's not, hopefully, it's not only a book about, it's not only a book about poetry, but for me to say poetry is to say life. So there's no difference between writing of poetry and writing of my life. Um, it's the same thing. Now, I want to get back to you. Um, so, um, I guess I, I'm wondering this question. Um, is, write, is writing about trauma traumatic and for you? And, and if so, what mitigates that? Or if not, why not? And and do you see this as a book that centers on trauma? Those are all great questions. <laughs> I'll kind of do my best to go in and out of them. I'll just tell you one thing. I, I don't know if Christy's here, but when the book first came out, I gave it to a friend, a dear friend who's literally saved my life. And she went home, I went home, and that night, much later, she texted me and just said that she was having these really strong and powerful connections to specific poems, um, things that related to her own life, people she knew. And I had this bizarre experience of thinking, oh, people are going to read this book. I hadn't, I hadn't gotten that far. I'd gotten as far as writing the poems, mm -hmm. ordering them, putting them in a book, happy to have the book accepted by Red Hen Press. And that was as far as my brain went. And now all of a sudden I realized people were going to go to bookstores at different places in the country. And for the price of a, you know, diner meal, they were going to get my book and, and find out this thing that I didn't talk about for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I did have a moment of like, what have I done? I, I haven't thought this through. The truth is that it was, and I hadn't used the word trauma. Trauma sounds like something very serious and very big. And um, I used to work, this is a, a sideways answer, but I used to work for Amnesty International. And I worked with a lot of people who'd been tortured and imprisoned and nobody thought they'd had it that bad. They're like, well, I was only tortured and put into solitary for nine months, not like this person that had it X amount of time. So I think, especially women tend to diminish what their experience was and think, oh, I don't wanna claim something. So I never used that word until other people used it. Um, and I think 
Di, you were one of the people you talked about a coerced midterm abortion. And I, I can remember where I was sitting and how I caught my breath because you named something that I didn't really have language for. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to write about the actual um, experience of abortion, the poem I read tonight. Um, that's one of the later poems in the book. I did what what I tell my students not to do, and I did exactly what my students do, and I think some of them are here tonight, which is I wrote around the subject, mm -hmm. because the subject itself felt too hot, didn't know if I could do it, and it might be too traumatic. And to be honest with you, you know, I'm sure there was some trauma, but I remember every single thing about that experience, or at least enough to, you know, more than shows up in any of the poems, the date that it happened, where, you know, all of this. Mm -hmm. It did take care of the nightmares. I'm I'm thinking of that as the, um, you know, the kind of medical prognosis. If you want to get rid of nightmares of trauma, write a book about it. And it, it gave it a place for it to, to live. And I think mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. It feels like now that it's done and out in the world, um, it feels freeing and a little nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let it be out in the world instead of roiling around inside of you. And, you know, those of us who've been through it need need that too. And I'm not saying, you know, it. I wouldn't say, oh, this is an abortion book. Um, that diminishes it. Um, it you do a brilliant job of um, both telling it, but also um, it's part of the, it's part of, it, it's a metaphor. I mean, it's, it's part of what you're doing as a speaker with how you evolved and became this being who wrote this book. So it's, it's not as simple as being about abortion. Um, but um, yeah, I think trauma is in a sense diminishing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a line in modern poetry, a poem called Rhapsody, which, you know, is that I hate the word trauma um, because it, it's become sort of a, a catchphrase. Um, but, you know, your book is bigger than that. And, um, So, yeah, I, you know, I just want, was it when you would write, for instance, the, the questionnaire, um, the survey, was it disturbing? Like when you finish, finish the draft, were you like, oh, motherfucker, what have I done? You know, or were you like, woo? I kind of, I think I had fun with it. There's a little bit of mm -hmm. sassiness there, you know. I thought so too. There are funny moments. Yeah. That was one, I mean, because the book is so new, I think I'm still learning things about it. And I was with a, a online group of um, people who had read the book and they're like, there's a lot of humor in your book. And I'm like, I'm funny, really? That, I mean, and, and yet I think that's true. And I think that's true of your book as well. I don't think a poem has to be one thing or another. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not how we live. And I think one of the things I learned working at Amnesty was humor is what gets us through some really, you know, horrendous moments and horrible times. You can laugh at it. And so, um, yeah, I wouldn't say that it, it I, I kept that. And I kept thinking I'm not that 20 something young woman anymore. Yes. She had a really hard time of it. There was no one for her to turn to mm -hmm. and she did the best she could, but I don't feel like I'm writing about the Susan of 2024, that was a while ago. And I think that made it easier. Um, I have this real quick story and then I realized we're just like chatting and chatting and maybe people have questions, but um, I went to grad school, a couple of people here, Caitlin Hibbert's here from grad school from University of Oregon and Garrett Hongo was my um, advisor for my, my thesis. And I don't know how it came up, but on the very last day I met with him, somehow the idea that I'd had an abortion and been engaged to this French guy came up and he looked at me and he said, that's your next book. That's your book. Mm. And I looked back at him and thought, this man is insane. I, <laughs> I can't say that to him because he's my professor and he wouldn't take it well, but this man is insane. Why would I take the most difficult thing I had lived through and put it out there? 
And he must have seen something on my face that recognized that. And he said, because it's not just your story, it's yeah. all of our stories. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, it took me a long time to get it, but I'm still friendly with him. Like Garrett, that thing you said to me, you know, 25 years ago, I finally got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's the book. And why not write into the highest stakes of all? You know, why mess around? Always. I think always we we have to um, go for the for the hardest, the deepest, the widest. Why not? That's a wonderful place to pause. But I will say one of the reasons was I didn't think I could do it. And I think mm -hmm. it took me um, all the years in between and saying, I've got to get this one right. No matter what else happens, this one I've got to get right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I did, but it the stakes being that high mm -hmm. pushes us to find a way to be for me to be a better writer mm -hmm. you 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 spent some time self-educating to get to the place where you could write the book that had to be written isn't that great i mean i'm i'm happy that you got there because it is a great book thank you thank you mm -hmm. it's well, important it's, a, it's important to us. Well, for something to change the mood a little bit, although I'm not sure what the answer is going to be. Um, when I was looking at interviews with you, Diane, from like way back and hearing wonderful things, one of the things that struck me was you talked about your mom being a great influence on you. And you said one of the things that um, her laughter was one of the things you said. Um, her, I think you said something about her positivity or her optimism, but the thing that stuck in my mind, because I don't know what it is, is her funeral salad. <laughs> I want to know what her funeral salad is because it's so like mysterious to me. All I could think of was noodle kugel, which is what <laughs> happens in, you know, my tradition. That would have been better. Um, yeah. Well, you know, where I'm from, there's a lot of funeral dishes. There's funeral salad, there's funeral potatoes. <laughs> And I love it because it's, it's like, you know, this, it's a, it's death is right next to you. It's a reality. You butcher the chicken, you make the funeral chicken, you know? So um, funeral salad, there are versions, but um, they're all jello. That but would have been my guess. Yeah, they're all jello. <laughs> various, various versions of jello. And yeah. The one she made was really good. I'm not opposed to Jello. I mean, you know, no. If it wasn't noodle kugel, it was um, the Jello molds with different things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This one had a, a bizarre topping um, that you cooked on top of the stove and then slathered over it. It was good. You know, if you have to go to a funeral, might as well have Jello. Yeah, funeral salad. There's just something about that image that, it, you know, you could mm -hmm. have told me anything that was funeral salad or just funeral food. And I, yeah. don't I knew that noodle kugel was a funeral food until my parents died and every single person who came to the house, um, one or two jello molds, but mostly it was noodle kugel. And we mm -hmm. would like laugh hysterically at like, you know, who made the best noodle kugel? And this one used cheese and this one toasted it. And <laughs> Um, there is something really comforting in that, that there's a food for that moment when, when mm -hmm. everything falls apart. Yes. Yes. So um, Kelly, we've got about seven minutes. Do you have questions or does the. Yeah. Does um, anyone want to put in any questions in the chat? That was wonderful. Um, oh my gosh. And the conversation was so, ex it was very inspiring. I forgot that I was hosting and it was a very mercury and retrograde given that I got muted the beginning and then the recording randomly turns off yeah we're screwed with mercury you know <laughs> so does anyone have any conversations um that that um you want to ask Susan and I were talking di a little earlier about um how how Keats got into this. Now we know with Frank, it was Frank O'Hara and sonnets, and then Keats was Keats and ballads. Mm -hmm. And how did Keats get invited into this little shindig? Well, I've got a thing for him. What can I say? 
Um, I think, you know, Keats as, as a sort of central figure of romantic poetry, and this book kind of teeters uh, between modernism and modern poetry, whatever that is, and, and the romantic, which is probably more my jam. And um, also then personally, this man who died so young, which as did my father. And so um, it's a comfortable place for me to speak with um, a ghost of a young man. Um, and I love that I love Keats for constantly he he did what I ho hope I'm doing partly in modern poetry, which is grapple with what is this thing we do, and what is the best position you know his notion of negative capability of having the capacity like Susan does in her book to sit with with the mystery, with the discomfort of the mystery and not solving it. And so all of that um, drew me to Keats. For some reason, I seem to need or want an interlocutor um, when I'm writing. I like a sort of foil or other. Frank was a little more nettlesome, um, Frank O'Hara, which I think he would have been in real life. Keats was more tender and um, and through him, through his ghost and his revisiting of love, um, he, he finds objectivity as a value to be objective about romance, about love. And that's probably the central theme of this book that poetry has a place for objectivity as it does love um that it's a place to reside and it doesn't it even coldness has its place so all that that's wonderful both you and susan have that in um common about your connection with like dead mentors that was a term I got from Susan a while back. And I think I read an article or an interview die with you where you, I think you had read Kevin Young's, I think it was called Deadism. And Deadism, just, yeah. Yeah, that essay. Yeah, where he says, you know, rather than trying to convince ever, everybody that poetry isn't dead, let's write from death itself. Let's mm -hmm. write from the dead. And I think that's what always drew me to poetry, that it is that that gate between the living and the dead. I needed a way to keep the channel open. And that's what poetry is for me. So, yeah. I know Susan had a lot of connections with Elizabeth Bishop. Mm. And she does, so. I wonder how Elizabeth Bishop feels about that. <laughs> we do have a question for both of you okay um this is from connie to both susan and diane what is one of your favorite book titles of poetry books that you have read so since we had a good conversation about titles which is what's a title you admire mm. it's always hard when it's on the spot i know like i can't think of books um, I like um, Obit. I I like yeah. that title. It's so pared down. Um, Susan. Well, I'm thinking of two at once. One of them is Elizabeth Bishop's um, because it's tongue in cheek. She was still alive when she did the complete poems, right? You know, <laughs> she has the complete poems which, you know, I liked her sense of humor. There's a lot of humor in her work. So I find that title wildly entertaining. And then there's something about Terrence Hayes, all of his titles, but I would say particularly how to be drawn because mm -hmm. it's drawn out of something, it's drawing, it's like all of the different multitude of meanings 
that come from that word and that mm. links things in different ways. Uh, so I like titles that either make me smile or titles that are doing lots of dimensions all at once. Um, and I love titles. Like I said, I, I titles of poems. So often my students don't title anything. They just don't think it's important. Mm. And it drives me nuts. Yeah. Um, I like, I almost said to Terrence Hayes, um, wind, wind in a box, mm. um, because it's such a great image for what a poem is, you know, um, a, the, the structure and the lyric. It, it's such an inviting title to me. And it's the body, it's the physical body, the breath inside a body, it's the wind in the box, I think also on a radio or a, um, mm -hmm. some kind of recording, the, you know, a boom box, like again, just doing all these different meanings as you go mm -hmm. through the book. Yeah. Do yeah, you want more or do you want to call it a night? We're at six. Yeah, or nine where I am. Oh, nine. We'll <laughs> call it a night. <laughs> both. It was an honor to host both of you. And I, these books, if you haven't bought them again, I'll put it in the chat, all the links. Um, I may not cover anyone's names. I've read them um, both. I actually, I, I, ha I misplaced them both, rebought them. So um, there's copies around my house. It, they've just been the books I've been carrying around with me. Your reading tonight was an honor for us to host. We're so thankful to have you as poets in the world and as friends. And um, thank you all and have a really good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you thank so much. I'll be your silver player. I'll find a reason to lay here all season Let the cigarette gardens grow And yes, I'll take you to France We'll get fucked up on gin And we'll dance and we'll dance